Jeff Gundy comes from a farming family. When he went off to college, uh, college changed his life. And and he uh, subsequently became a college teacher for the rest of his life and a very distinguished career he's had at Bluffton University. Uh, his eight books include Without a Plea from Bottom Dog Press in 2019, Abandoned Homeland from Bottom Dog 2015, and Somewhere Near Defiance from Anhinga Press 2014, for which he was named Ohio Poet of the Year. His latest prose book is Wind Farm, Landscapes with Stories and Towers from Dos Madres Press uh, 2021. His poems and essays appear in Georgia Review, The Sun, Kenyan Review, Forklift, Ohio, Christian Century, Image, Cincinnati Review, and Terrain.org. A former Fulbright lecturer at the University of Salzburg in Austria, he now serves as writer in non-residence at Bluffton University, thanks to a major grant from the Seattle Foundation. Uh, a reviewer of, of, of his book, um, Somewhere Near Defiance, uh, says that, uh, that that reviewer finds parallel interest on the earthly and the divine uh, throughout the collection. Uh, and uh, it's a, the collection is an argument, in fact, that the two are much more closely, closely related than we often assume. Uh, he uh, merges pop culture references alongside meditations of matters of seemingly more importance. Uh, somewhere near defines his special strength lies in the description of human-made spaces and objects. His poetry is at its best when it explores the messy world, flirting with transgression as its speakers think about flirting with the women they meet. Many poets, uh, 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 Jeff included, uh, write about nature well, but he excels at the rare difficult skill of making us care about others' mundane material lives in our cement ensconced civilization. Uh, I'm tempted to read a 13-line poem, uh, uh, which uh, under the title, Why I Keep Shoveling the Cursed Driveway, but I'm going to cede the time to Jeff so that he can read the poems of his choice, poems or fiction. Uh, let's welcome him. Thanks. Thanks, Ed, for that very gracious introduction. And thanks, everyone, uh, for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm really uh, pleased to uh, be, be in the company of you all tonight, if only via this electronic medium. I, I wasn't going to do this, but uh, Colleen started talking about questions and first books and all this and all that. And my first book was called uh, Inquiries. And uh, so I thought I would read uh, a poem from that book, just, just in the spirit of things. Uh, so this poem, and you were also talking, Colleen, about uh, remembering where you wrote this poem. And I distinctly remember writing this one about a quarter mile uh, to the west of here on the Bluffton campus in a little patch of woods where I sort of snuck out while my kids were little um, at the in the afternoon before I had to go home and, and all of that. Uh, and there was chainsaw. Somebody was um, operating a chainsaw as I was sitting there, you know, inviting the poem. And uh, and I was tempted to write, you know, why is our, you know, the, the angry poem about chainsaws. And, and then I decided I would uh, I would try to take a different approach. So this is called Chainsaw Inquiries, uh, Questions and Answers, really. What do chainsaws love? Lumber, dust, live wood pulled down by the dying, sun on last year's leaves. Do chainsaws share a hidden fear? Rocks, nails, a few older fear their appetites and that what they chew does not nourish them. If chainsaws dream of what? Of hands that never tire, tanks that never empty, forests rising quick as grass, a heaven where silence never falls. Do chainsaws share a secret grief? They cannot hold what they eat, cannot keep what they kill, they cannot feed themselves. 
So that's that's my chainsaw poem. Uh, I had this notion uh, since I, you know, I've published a number of books of uh, trying to sort of dip in and out of several of them tonight. And uh, so I, I'm going to try to do that without uh, going on too, too long. Um, and so uh, I'm going to read a poem or two from this uh, collection called uh, Deer Flies. I think just one. Um, and this is uh, when, when I was, uh, yeah, a, a younger man, um, I, I tended to write mostly either uh, in the in the late afternoons, kind of this little period in between uh, when I was at work and when I needed to be home uh, to relieve my beloved spouse of time with the kids, uh, or when I got out of town somehow. And uh, I spent some time in Yellow Springs, Ohio, uh, over several different uh, summers. And uh, this is this is one of those poems that came out of that time. Uh, it's called Night Comes to Yellow Springs. And, and this is very much a narrative poem uh, as well. It, just, it all really happened just like this. Night Comes to Yellow Springs. Do you know where the Springs Motel is? Yes, I do. Back to the light. Turn right a mile or so on Xenia Road. Oh, we must not have gone far enough. Thank you, she says. And the driver pulls the old van away. I think they'll turn left into a driveway and go back, but no. I think they'll turn right and go around the block, but no, they head straight west, the wrong way, out of sight and lost. And so perplexed and futile again, I keep walking the quiet summer streets. Even at 10, there's light. If you lift your eyes, if you're not in the car, if you wait for the broken down Jeep to crawl on, if you pause between the scant streetlights, flickers of the common irreplaceable day slip through the low grass, the parked cars, the houses giving back the day's heat. Walk long enough and you'll imagine oblivion and joy like two sidewalks on the same side of the street. Walk long enough and you'll feel the motors chilling bedrooms, freezers, kitchens, feel the buried lines snap and surge and hold, not a single break between the sleepy village and the coal that burns to spin the turbines half a state away. If you walk long enough, you will remember all the riders peering strangely through the dark, turning in confusion, asking any stranger where their rest is to be found. Yeah, it really happened just like that. I, you know, I, I told these people, well, you got to go back this way and turn, turn right at the, you know, and, oh, okay, thank you, thank you. And then they just went, I, so, I, I assume they got somewhere eventually. I, I hope they found uh, the motel at some point. I don't know. Don't know. Um, so I want to read another uh, road poem here next, I think. And uh, this is from a book called Spoken Among the Trees. Um, and, and I wrote this uh, traveling out to Pennsylvania. And uh, it was a cold, snowy, nasty kind of day uh, then. So, you know, it seems seems appropriate to this season of the year. Um, and this has a, an epigraph, which is from the first Samuel. And uh, it's about the story of uh, David and Goliath. Uh, then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. Oh, cheerful, cheerful way of starting. Uh, I will warn you, this is this is a not a cheerful kind of poem, really. Uh, late Psalm. It was dark when I left town and still dark when day had come. The sky and trees dulled and damp. I remembered the preacher. Consider David and Goliath, he said, the two of them boasting of their strength and the God who loved them, both of them warning that the other's sweet body must fall bloody in the dust and be torn by dogs. The children came up to hear the story told for them. I drove through scant snow and the long spectacle of tree after tree after tree, each brown and gray in its winter simplicity, singular, alone and not alone. 
Then the big oak church, like another easy growth. Couldn't we name all the churches after trees and creeks? I wanted some sunshine, but that didn't mean I would get it. I wanted some words as clear and sharp as swords instead of a sword. Flurries and sunshine breaking through, and suddenly the word sublime was in my head. I let a truck in ahead of me, past another, headed down the long curving hill. And Jackson Brown sang, he rescued truth from beauty and meaning from belief. And the snowflakes seemed sparse enough to count, though I soon gave up. There are many worlds, and they are all this world, held apart by thin braces of time and weather. Sometimes you can spray all you want and let the wipers run, but the windshield just won't come clean. Besides forgiveness, there must be something else, something like abandon, going on without forgetting, without fear, abandoned like the site of an ambush or the last camp on the way to the ambush or the place where a few hungry people stayed afterward, no water, no fire, just a place to lie down in the snow. Oh, that's so dark. Every time I, every time I read that, I think, oh, oh, that's so, that's so dark. Uh, all right. I, I will read one that is less, much less dark. Than that one. Uh, this is the first poem in this book. I I wanted to call this book "Almost a Lost City," which is a phrase that's in this uh, poem. And then before, just before it came out, uh, the editor uh, wrote and told me that there was another book with almost exactly that title coming out about the same time. And uh, I mean, you can't copyright titles, so I could call it the same thing. But he didn't he didn't think it was a good idea. So um, we went. Through, I went through the whole book trying to find another phrase for the title. I literally read through the entire manuscript. I think I did this more than once. And um, I got to the last poem. And the last line in the last poem is um, to be spoken among the trees. There's your trees, Colin. You know, so, so, and that, that ended up being the title. So, all right. But this is the first poem, uh, which is called uh, Folks Run. To Cumberland. And uh, this, I, I wrote this coming back with my wife from uh, Harrisonburg, uh, Virginia, through the mountains, weaving around through all these uh, little roads and, and seeing all these signs for these interesting places. Folks run to Cumberland. We were almost a lost city when my companion said, This is beautiful, but I'm so sleepy. Sleep, I said knowing I had the wheel and coffee in the mug, and soon she was traveling blind beside me. I steered on and refused every side road, no matter how winding and inviting. I let Maggie's Creek Road and Narrow Lane and Tom's Knob approach slide on by. I grumbled only a little at the long stoplight at the one-lane bridge. My companion was leaned way back, dreaming of angel-haired lovers for all I knew, breathing so easy I thought she must be hearing the sweet shoals of the lost river running low along the road, whispering for half a, a mile before turning away as the hills said they must. I obeyed every last curl in the road and turned up the stereo, hoping my companion would awaken and speak. I've been dreaming. You were there. Golden-haired angels were there. We must go back and turn at Lost City, take the narrow lane into the mountains. I saw a perfect seed head shaking in the golden evening, every puff a signal and a sign. Don't you remember what the river said as it caressed the gray stones? Listen. But my companion only turned and rode her slumber onward, leaving all the rest to me. Last night I dreamed that I was dreaming, sang the singer. A fluted hill, a long curve. On the lake, five geese stirred, shook out their wings, and disappeared. Yeah, there's there's a little a little more uh grace in in that one, isn't there? Um all right, I'm going to just keep moving right ahead here. Um 
this book called Abandoned Homeland. Uh, you were you were mentioning that press, Colleen, and, and I could say something similar about uh, about Bottom Dog, uh, which comes out of uh, uh, Huron, Ohio. A guy named Larry Smith has edited that for decades now, and published four of my books. Well, this is my first book, Inquiries, and uh, this one, and uh, Without a Plea as well, and one more in in the middle there. Um, and again, a regional. Uh, Larry's a guy with a regional focus and it's very interested in working class uh, labor kinds of poems. And also he's, he's sort of a Buddhist and just a, a, a great guy who's done a great deal for uh, the writing in our part of the world. Um, this is a poem, a quite different poem in terms of tone, I think uh, it's called cookies. And um, it was, written kind of in response to Pablo Neruda's wonderful poem. Uh, I can never remember the title of it, but the first line is, I'm tired of being a man. And he goes on to describe all these things that he wants to do, uh, you know, as, that he's ready to give up and, and all the things about the city that he's in that just drive him crazy. Yeah. So this is, this is a little like that. Uh, cookies. I'm tired of being respectable and professional. For too long, I've gone into classrooms and bathrooms and churches, smiling and brittle as a garden gnome or a homecoming queen waving to the cold bystanders. The aura of solid houses makes my insides quiver. I want to walk into every one, houses I've passed by for 20 years and never entered. I want to sit in the big recliners, steal cookies from the jars on medicine on kitchen counters, rifle through magazines, check in medicine cabinets and under beds for scandalous revelations. I'm tired of being available and polite. I'm ready to be invisible, grouchy, and stupid. I'm ready to stand up in the middle of the meeting and scratch myself on the way out the door. I'm ready to bring my guitar to class, set up between the students and the door, play every song I've ever played, every song I can remember, without explanation or apology, whether or not I know the chords or can hit the high notes. Luai, luai, kumbaya. All nine verses have stuck inside of Mobile with the Memphis blues again. I'm ready to be a bad wizard, to change morons into moonshine, dutiful drudges into parsley, solid citizens into Corvettes and cotton mouths. I'm ready to fill up with gas on the way out of town and stick to the township roads so narrow that somebody has to take the shoulder. To drive a wide spiral until I find God or Lake Erie or the providential, proverbial, preverbal Mississippi. So low now I can barrel right across it with barely a splash or a slither and sail on into the blue gold American night. <laughs> Whatever's going on with that. that. Yeah, that that one was fun. Uh, uh, I'm going to read just a, a little poem, um, and uh, the special occasion for this one is that I wrote it a, in East Lansing um, at, um, the. there used to be a festival there every year. There was a meeting of the Society for the Study of Midwestern Literature and the Midwest Poetry Festival, and this is where I met Ed Moore, and I'm yeah. pretty sure. That's right, isn't it, Ed? And um, so one uh day during this festival I sort of snuck out as you will see from the poem <clears throat> and uh, was sitting on a bench somewhere on campus there and uh, this is this is what came out of that uh, natural theology from the Sherman bench East Lansing May 2003 that was a little while ago already if I really loved Jesus I would surely not be here in the sunshine I'd be trying to love the poets, now reading in a room without me. If I really, really loved, I would not even think what I think, and it would go easier. Because my neighbor's dogs bark at dawn for sheer joy, because like them, I have known joy. I have matched and folded the family socks, survived history so far, seen my small desires satisfied. Did I come all this way to sit on a bench? Did the ragged goose feather once have a home? 
It's too hot to sit long in the sun. Can we, can we, can we? The girl asks her mother. And her brother hitches his pants and runs fast as he can down the wrong path. His sister calls and he runs back, sniffs a yellow tulip. Oh, do what you want, says her mother and the new weeds. And the cardinal says, I will do what I can. That's, that's that one. Um, and I want to read a couple of poems from uh, this book, which is called Without a Plea. This is the most recent book of poems that I've done. And this is uh, one of the, it's, it's sort of a list poem. Um, It's called Things I Plan to Create Upon Achieving Sufficient Focus. I, I don't know. I suspect if, if if you folks are are like me, um, you many days think of all the things that are wrong with the world and how little ability, uh, I think, I have to fix any of them, which is sometimes frustrating. You know, I don't know if you find things that way or not. Um, anyway, so this, yeah, this starts small and uh, sort of, builds from that uh, and the little epigraph from this is from a great poem by uh dean young uh it's called the poem is called rothko's yellow and the line is i have to focus so hard i seem to create it there's a poem things i plan to create upon achieving sufficient focus small things first a pixie maybe a bridge troll Sweatpants, dressy enough to wear every day. Sport coats, comfortable as sweatpants. An endless supply of balmy spring days to be warehoused nearby, available on demand. Some days of steady warm rain, likewise. A set of bells that will subtly rearrange hearts and minds, nudge the fearful fist open, unfurrow the fretful brow, a place of generous exile on a mainly habitable moon of Saturn, say, for those unwilling to heed the bells. A transport mechanism, foolproof, safe, and allowing only photos of baby goats and moving tales of adversity overcome to return. A salve for all wounds, a syrup for all coughs, a balm for all fevers, a touch to ease heartache, to bring release to the captives, bread and warmth and roses to the poor, open hearts and eyes to the oblivious rich. A dust to heal the waters, make the plastics vanish, cool the oceans, mend the sky, and lunch. I especially like lunch there at the end. Uh, yeah, not, not that one should be uh, saying yeah, such things about one's own poems, probably. So here's here's one, um, another poem written kind of in conversation with a, an earlier poem. Um, you may or may not know that it was an early poem by uh, William Butler Yeats called The so Song of Wandering Angus. I love this poem. I see a few nods around their uh, room. Uh, it's uh, the story of the poem, which is based on Irish uh, folktale, is that Angus goes out uh, fishing and he catches this fish, brings it home. Um, and the fish turns into this glittering girl uh, who calls his name and then runs away. And he spends the rest of his life trying to chase, trying to catch her, you know, chasing her down. It's absolutely plain from the poem that he is never going to get there, but he does it anyway. And the, the last uh, quatrain is just one of the most beautiful uh, ones I know. And uh, it talks about how he's going to... Uh, uh, catch up with her, kiss her lips and take her hand and walk till time and times are done. The silver and pluck till time and times are done. The silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. Yeah, it's so lovely. Um, anyway, I, I decided to try uh, writing my own poem with a similar kind of form, but setting it in Bluffton. Um, and um, so here's, here's what came out. It, it took a quite... Yeah, a different term. Another song. I went down to Riley Creek because my heart was sore and sad, and I slipped twice and laughed and swore and scared a muskrat from his bed. 
I threw some rocks into the creek and a bat flew in the groping dusk where a yellow backhoe crouched and slept, dreaming of broken stone and mud and leaves of yellow and of brown way like scraps of a tattered book torn to pieces by a girl who only sought an easy song, some danger, joy, and misery, and then a sweet and liquid kiss in a greeny field. What else to do? Why not? The land scoured bleak, cold rain denting the black earth. Too late, too far, the borders closed, the towers of paradise aflame and cooled already, ash and smoke. That is also kind of grim, is it not? Is it not? It's, a, it's a hard life, friends. You just have to just have to, we just have to, yeah, live, live, live in it, don't we? Um, so uh, Ed mentioned this this wind farm book, uh, which, as he says, is it's a prose book, but uh, a couple of the pieces in it were published as poems. Um, I, I like to think of them uh, it as kind of lyric essays, um, and I want to just read oh, one section from near the end of this book, and then I'll read a, maybe a couple of new poems. Um, this is from a section which is called the, the uh, chapters or sections tend to have these uh, long and uh, sort of inflated titles. This is called The Wind Farmer Reflects on Great Symphonic Fullness and Sparse Habitations. Um, so I'll just let you know very quickly the background. Uh, I grew up in central Illinois on a farm on the prairie, as Ed mentioned that. And there's a great big wind farm now that begins uh, right around on the section where I grew up, where my brother's still farming. Um, and so this book is partly about wind farms, uh, but it's also kind of a memoir sometimes. And, and um, it sort of tries to do a bunch of different things. Uh, anyway, um, as I was as I was working on this book, I read this book by Mark Doty, uh, who's a wonderful uh, American poet, uh, called "What Is the Grass?" And this book is about Walt Whitman and uh, uh, Hart Crane and Frank O'Hara and a bunch of these uh, gay New York poets and uh, Brooklyn and the Brooklyn Bridge and Whitman's poem about Brooklyn Ferry and so forth. So I read this book, which was you know really quite wonderful. And felt sort of entirely alienated in terms of, you know, my own life and uh, the people and the places that he was talking about. Not, not in terms of their poetry, but in terms of uh, the location and so forth. Uh, and then I started thinking, well, you know, if, if the Brooklyn Ferry and the Brooklyn Bridge are uh, almost metaphors in themselves, as, I, as they kind of are, uh, the wind farm is too, yeah, in a way, and the prairie is too. And so I, uh, I started spinning off of that, and this, this is what came out of that, and I'll just, just kind of pick it up near the end. Imagine Walt Whitman getting a first look at the Menonk wind farm. Stepping out of a train, perhaps, if there were still passenger trains that came anywhere near. Or being driven out from New York by some anachronistic guide, some poet, Mark Doty maybe, or me, pulling off at one of the abandoned farmsteads or one of the gravel drives that lead to each turban, looking around at the towers spreading in the, off in all directions like a field of ungainly cranes. And what is the great Good gray poet have to say, does his guide explain the intricate hidden network that binds the turbans together, that sends off the power they sift from the wind to give light and heat and all the rest across the land? Did the guide study all this beforehand to impress the great man? And would Brother Wall take it all in and understand at once, begin to declaim his own ode to the wind farm? Or would he stand in silence, face to face with something large enough, strange enough to quiet his voice for once. After all my time with the wind farm, I know only a little of it. The old saw, write what you know, is no more than a place to begin. We can say so little clearly and surely, even of what we know best, the things and people closest to us. Some shapes, some images, some stories can be teased out, given a certain patience with things and people with sentences, with words, 
resistance is real, but not total. And this is as it must be. Nobody owns the language, the letters, the shapes. Somebody owns the towers and the shivers of current that spin away from them through the miles of secret wires, perhaps to the very machine on which my contrary, non-essential impulses are recorded and stored. Somebody owns the land, the ditches, the roads, but nobody owns the wind. So there's that. I, th I think I'll, I'll just read... Um, one more little poem, and um, this is another, it's a church poem. Yeah, I grew up going to church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, you know, and uh, we spent a lot of time in that building. Um, and it's just a little story about one of the days there when I was a kid. It was a potluck after, after church on Sunday, I think. Running across the pews. Just once during a potluck, I went upstairs with some of my friends, our parents still nibbling and chatting in the basement. And it must have been winter because we ran around the square plain sanctuary as though it was a playground. We discovered that we could run across the tops of the pews. They were spaced a longish but not impossible distance apart. It was fun and not even really scary to stride from the front to the back with the comforting padded seats, promising a soft-ish landing if a foot slipped. But when I turned and started back, I saw instead the hard backs of the pews and the floor a goodly way down. If I missed a step, the landing would hurt plenty. I kept going, of course, not because anybody was watching, but because I was bent on finishing. I was alert, but not panicky, pretty sure I could do this. I made the little leaps as though my stumpy legs were born for nothing more than leaping from pew to pew, day into month into year, making the good landings or the hard one. So thank you. Thank you.